So we're in John. Just to touch you, just to catch you up, last week we did the uh, the washing of the feet and uh, and also Jesus naming that he had a uh, someone who was going to betray him and he handed the piece of bread that was dipped to Judas and Judas takes the bread and leaves and now he goes on and he says to his disciples starting in John 13 31 so when they had gone out Jesus said the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him if God is glorified in him God will also glorify him in himself and the glory and glorify him immediately little children I shall be with you a little longer and you will not see me and as I had said to the Jews where I am going you cannot come so now I say to you a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another by this they will know that you are my disciples if you love one another Simon Peter said to him Lord where are you going Jesus answered him where I am going you cannot follow me now but shall follow me afterwards you shall follow me afterwards Peter said to him Lord why can't I follow you now I will lay down my life for your sake and Jesus answered him will you lay down your life for my sake most assuredly I say to you the rooster shall crow won't shall not crow until you have denied me three times and then in John 14 1 he says let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it was not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may also you may be also and where I go you know and the way you know now I'm not supposed to do this this is happening next week <laughs> but it's like a cliffhanger <laughs> so let me give you a little taste Thomas says to him how can we know in the verses to come and I'm paraphrasing and Jesus said to him I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me and that was the way that they were supposed to know so I'm breaking this these passages down in four sections first one is the son and the father are glorified the second one is the new commandment the third one is and I pray that the Lord helps me make sense of this for you dying is easy living is hard and let not your heart be troubled starting with the son is glorified son and the father are glorified in John 13 31 it says so when he had gone out Jesus said the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him if God is glorified in him God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately question is is how they get glorified and I believe that the answer is summed up in one word obedience Jesus was glorified by God and glorified God by his obedience to the Father we don't know much about the first 30 years of Jesus's life scripture tells us very little however in Psalm 69 we are given a glimpse of what Jesus suffered during his childhood. And it also makes the verse in Isaiah 53 really hit home where it says, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow acquainted with grief. In Psalm 69, starting in verse two, the Psalmist says, which is David, I sink in the deep mire where there is no standing I have come into the deep water where the where the flow the flood overflows me 
I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without cause, without a cause, are more than the hairs on my head. They are mighty who would destroy me. Being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. O oh God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. And Jesus was sinless. Let not those who wait for you, O Lord of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. Because for your sake I have bore reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. Jesus was denied by his brethren, which are the Jews, and his own brothers mocked and ridiculed him. Because of the zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproach of those who reproach you has fallen on me. When I weep and chasten my soul with fasting, that becomes my reproach. I also made sackcloth for my garment. And I have become a byword to them. Those who sit at the gate speak against me. And I am a song of the drunkards. And he's talking about the leaders in his community. He, was, he went back to Nazareth after he was born in Bethlehem. And they all knew the story about Mary and Joseph. They all knew that Mary was supposedly had gotten pregnant by the Holy Spirit, though she claimed. But they all didn't believe it. Mary got a lot of criticism. So did Joseph. And so did Jesus as a child. And if you remember, as we, in, when we were in John 8, when the Pharisees looked at him and said, we were not born of fornication. They were calling Jesus a bastard. Deliver me out of the, of, deliver me out of the mire. And let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep shadow me and let not the pit shut its mouth on me. He was bullied, he was ridiculed, he was mocked. Drunks made a song about what they claimed to be Mary's infidelity. He was teased when he tried to be righteous, when he defended the law, when he defended God as a child, he was also mocked and ridiculed and made to think that here's one that's holier than thou. But we also know that he was sinless. And we know this by when he started his ministry. In Matthew 3.16, it says, When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Holy Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus was glorifying God even in his childhood. Like I said, we don't know much about his childhood, and there's a lot of stories, and they're just stories. But we know he was sinless. We know he was obedient to his parents. We know that he was obedient to God and even got mocked for it. Throughout his ministry, he was obedient. And he did and said only what the Father instructed him to do and say. In John 5.19, we learned weeks back, John 5, 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, 
even the Son gives life to those he wills. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. And he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. We discussed this in uh, Bible study on Friday night, and it's really, it is, many people want to claim they believe in God the Father, but they don't believe in Jesus. You can't believe in Jesus and not believe, you cannot believe in God the Father and not believe in Jesus. And Scripture tells us that. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of Man and those who hear it will live. For the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also. Because, because he is the Son of Man, do not marvel at this, the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now we know that none of us are good, no, not one. That the only way that we can be looked upon as being righteous is have Jesus' blood covering us. Those of us who believe in Jesus will be raised as the righteous. And those of us who don't believe in Jesus will have condemnation. I can by myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own, but the will of my Father who sent me. So we see that, that Jesus glorifies the Father by doing the will of the Father. And always doing exactly what he says. In the next passages, we see that Jesus' work and the finished work on the cross has glorified God and will glorify the Son. In John 12, we studied weeks back, John 12, 27, Jesus said, My soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice from heaven saying, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. That was a, a resounding test of approval that God was approving everything that Jesus had done. Everything that Jesus said in his name, all the miracles that Jesus did, everything, raising the dead, making the blind seen, the lame, the maimed healing the brokenhearted, healing the poor. Everything that Jesus did, the Father approved of because he did exactly what the Father wanted him to do. Nothing more and nothing less. In Philippians, it says in Philippians 2, 5, Paul says, let this be in your in, in, oh, I'm sorry, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name, of, name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow to those who are in heaven, to those who are on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of the Father. And that's how he glorifies the Son. He raises the Son. And the Gentiles is a gift to the Son. We're a gift for his obedience that he gives this church, this bride, to his Son. 
But note this, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Everyone, those who believe and those who don't believe. Those who believe will be given rewards for their service for God. Those who don't believe will face the white throne judgment and receive condemnation. But every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. I advise people to do it now while you have a chance. I advise our, our audience out there, if anyone doesn't know the Lord, do it now. The other one's not going to be pleasant. The new commandment, probably one of the toughest commandments we've ever given. A lot of stuff is easy to do, but this commandment is, is tough. In John 13, 34, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, we will know, they will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The church has been left to do the work and the will of the Son and the Father. We do it with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In case we miss it, the church is you and me and not this building. And one of the hardest things for us to do is to love one another, to be loving, to care for one another. But we're commanded by the Lord. We're also commanded to love our enemies. And that's in Matthew 5, 42, I believe. We're not going to go there, but that's where it is. That's a hard thing to do. It goes against everything that we think of. My enemy is my enemy. I shouldn't love my enemy, but the Bible talks extensively about that, about us loving our enemy. And while we were still his enemy, while we were still sinners, while we were still rebellious, while I was still running around doing what I wanted to do and only what I wanted to do, he loved me and called me and called you and continued to pursue us until we either totally reject him or we come to him. I praise God that I've come to him. But he loved me while I was his enemy. He set the example. Pastor Martin brought out last week how he washed the feet of his disciples. The man that was going to betray him, the man that betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver, and came into that garden and kissed him and said, Rabbi, hail Rabbi. He washed his feet, his enemy. And he knew what he was going to do. Because after washing his feet, he announced it. One is going to betray me. But he washed his feet anyway. He became the servant of everybody. That's how we can glorify God and glorify the Son. Is by becoming the servant of not focusing on ourselves. In Matthew 5, 14, it says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they take a, lamp, a light and light. They take the light, a lamp, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. So when we act like Jesus, when we let our light shine, when we're acting like the Son, when we're imitating Jesus, we glorify the Father. When we're selfish, when we're thinking about ourselves, the only ones we promote are ourselves, and that's not glorifying to the Father. He wants us to glorify him by treating everybody with love. The new command is that you love everybody. In John 15, 7, it says, If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, we know if we're walking in the Spirit, 
and the Holy, and the Holy Spirit is in us. The things that we're going to be asking for are the things that conform to the will of God and not our own desires. So he's not saying if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can pray for a Cadillac or a Mercedes Benz or a Land Rover, you know, or something like that and, and get it. He's saying that the will of God will be done. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I tell you, that my joy may remain in you, and that that your joy may be full. This commandment, that you love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Like I said before, in John 5, 4, I mean, Matthew 5, 42, we're even commanded to love our enemies. And in this way, we glorify the Father and the Son. When we imitate the Son, when the world looks at us and sees us, but sees the Son instead. In order to glorify God and the Son, you have to be sold out for Him. We can't be lukewarm. We have to be all in. All in for Jesus. All, when we say that He's our Lord, He has to truly be our Lord. In Mark 8, 35, it says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. I chose Mark because Jesus brings up the gospel. The so-called Christians in North America approach Christianity with a consumer mindset. What I want, I want it my way. And I want it now. That's the mindset Christianity has in this country. It's what the church can do for me. How are my feelings going to be satisfied? What program does it offer? Etc. The mindset sounds like nothing like the teaching of Jesus or what you find in the Bible. The command to love one another is opposite to self. It doesn't command you to love yourself. Oh, love yourself so you can love somebody else. It doesn't say that. God knows we love ourselves. Trust me, I love myself. You know, I can talk about, oh, I don't have, I have poor self-esteem, I have poor this. But the bottom line is, I love myself. Okay? My hard thing is loving other people like Jesus loved them, like God the Father loves them. That's my hard part. Our next one is, maybe I can make sense, like I said, if God's willing. Dying is easy. Living is hard. John 13, 36 says, Simon Peter said, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow until you deny me three times. Poor Peter. I I really do. I mean it. Poor Peter. I mean, how many sermons have been taught and, 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 and said about this incident, about Peter. Some call him a coward because the end result is he does deny Christ. Some called him a braggart in their sermons. But Peter was neither a braggart or a coward. He was neither one of them. In fact, Peter was willing to lay down his life for the Lord. You see that in John 18. We're going to get there. I'm touching on it now. I don't know why it was the Lord brought it to, <laughs> brought it to mind, but 
They come to take Jesus, okay, led by Judas. And they say they have a detachment in John 18, which is a cohort, which is roughly about 600 soldiers. So it wasn't like two or three gods came to pick up Jesus. There was like 600 soldiers plus the temple guards, plus the Pharisees, and they were all armed with clubs and swords and spears to pick up one man. Peter jumps out when they go to take Jesus, pulls out a sword. Now, picture it. There's 13 of them, counting Jesus. There's roughly about 700 of them. Peter jumps out, takes out his sword, and whacks off the ear of the of the high priest servant. That's not an act of a man who's afraid to die. He was willing to die for Christ. What he wasn't willing to do to live obedient. That's where G Peter gets it wrong. Now, he wasn't a coward. But he didn't make Jesus his total Lord up until that point in time. Peter was disobedient. His disobedience led to confusion. His confusion led to sin and or denying Christ three times. Jesus told his disciples that he was to be turned over to the authorities many times in Scripture. And that it was the Father's will. In fact, Jesus rebukes Peter when Peter tries to stop him from saying it in Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must be, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Peter, with one breath, calls him Lord, and the next breath tells him, no, that's not going to happen. And what does Jesus do? But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desire to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This was a few minutes ago. Jesus has a had asked them, who do men say I am? Who do you say I am? And Peter jumps up and says, you're the Christ. And he goes, blessed be, blessed be you, Peter, son of Jonah, because you haven't learned this from men, but you have learned it from heaven. And then a few minutes later, he's telling them, get behind me, Satan. Jesus wanted to follow, I mean, Peter wanted to follow Jesus, but in his own way. Just like the Pharisees who wanted a savior, he wanted the Christ to come, but they wanted it in their own way. Just as many of us in the church want to follow Jesus, but we want to follow him in our way. Do the things that I want to do. Live the way I want to live, not the way that God tells me to live. We see it throughout the whole church. But I caution everybody that wanting to do it your own way and not following the word of God will lead to sin, will lead you into false doctrines. Changing the word to fit your life will lead you away from God, not to God. We need to understand that while we are living, we are to live out our faith. That means live according to the word of God. We are, to, we are living in the times that Christianity, uh, Christianity is just a label, not a way of life. When people see our lives, they should see Jesus in us. Paul says it plainly. And like I said, to die is easy, to live is hard. Paul says, 
for me, in Philippians 1.21, for me, to live as Christ. Remember, Christ came as a servant. Christ came to die. Christ suffered. Suffered through his childhood. Suffered ridicule during his ministry. Suffered rejection. And then finally suffered with our sins on the cross. So when Paul says to live as Christ, he's not putting himself up on a pedestal. He's putting himself down as a servant. He's washing the feet of the saints and loving his enemy to live as Christ. And then he says, to die is gain. It is far better. We know that we suffer nothing more here than we do here, there. What we suffer here is just a taste of suffering. But when we go to heaven, there is nothing but pure happiness, pure joy. He will wipe away every tear from everyone's eyes. Our life with Christ is joyful. Everything that goes on here is painful. We have tribulation. We have problems. We have family problems. We have debt. We have living. It is easier to die than to live for Christ. It is to live obedient. He goes on to say, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. I know how he would choose death. <laughs> but for I am hard pressed between the two, living a desire, living, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm pressed, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more helpful, more needy, more needful for you. So he's saying, although Peter, I mean, Paul wished that he would, you know, be taken to the Lord. He's saying to stay here on earth was more beneficial to the people he was ministering to. To live is Christ, to die is gain. That's a, that's a thing that we all have to struggle with. I worry about the person that says, no, I don't want to go. I want to stay here more. I want to live my life. I don't care what age you are. I don't care what age you are. To live should be as Christ and, should, and to die should be gain. Let not our hearts be troubled, says in John 14, verse 1. We're going back there. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also. There you may be also. And where I go, you know. <laughs> and the way, you know. <laughs> I don't know why you gave me four. <laughs> you know. And like I said before, he gets challenged by, and Pastor Martin will bring it up next week, and um, by doubting Thomas, and he tells Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody gets to the Father but through me. You can't get it through Buddha. You can't get it through Hinduism. You can't get it through Islam. You cannot get to the Father. And these churches and these people who are out there preaching that there are more than one way to God the Father are just deceiving people because there is not. There is one way, one truth, one life, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus is comforting his disciples as well as us. Whether we go home to be with the Lord or we're raptured, because I believe this is also talking about the rapture. And in this church, we believe in the pre-rapture. He has been preparing a place for us for 2,000 years and is going to receive us to himself. This is a point that Paul makes 
in the next few scriptures that I'm going to read. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul helps explain this for us. He says, but I, don't, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Least you sorrow as others who have no hope. Paul is talking about the people who have no hope, and those are the ones who don't believe in Jesus Christ. Those are the ones who haven't accepted Christ as their Savior. Those are the ones who maybe believe in Christ and believe in everything else, like a smorgasbord. I believe in a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there. Let's be honest. These are religions that have been around a long time. Jesus doesn't allow us to do that. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So he says, least you sorrow as others who have no hope. If you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. And he's talking about those who died already in believing in Jesus. When the rapture comes, he's bringing them with him. They'll get their resurrected body to middle of whatever seconds, in a blink of an eye before us. But we're all getting our resurrected body if we live that long. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these. I want you to note something. Paul expected that Jesus could come back in his lifetime. He expected he could have been one of those who would have been raptured. So when people tell you that the rapture is a fairy tale, Paul the Apostle, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, who was anointed by God, believed the rapture could happen. And it could happen before his death. Paul continues to explain the hope that we have in 2 Corinthians 5, starting at verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And he's saying that once we die, okay, we have an eternal house. We have a new body coming to us. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to, to be clothed with the habitation which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For, that's good. For, 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 we, for we who are in this tent groan, being burdened. That's for sure. Not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. That mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. Those of us believers, the why, why we can face death, why we can face persecution, why when the time comes, we can face the trouble that we have to go through. Because the Holy Spirit is indwelt in us. We are given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that when I take off this tent, if I die before the rapture, that I will be in the presence of God. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, I'm reading it again, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So, where, so, so we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. 
We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. The minute we leave this body, the minute our spirit leaves, we are in the presence of God. We're in the presence of Jesus Christ. And we're given a spiritual body until the rapture happens, until the resurrection happens. And then we're given a new body that won't ache, that won't have pain, that will never die again, that will be here for eternity. I've been listening to a man who said, life is short, but eternity is forever. I want to end by saying that if you haven't received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you don't have no hope. And I'm not saying this to be mean, but if you have not accepted Jesus, you have no hope. The only hope that you have is that what you experience in the afterlife will be worse than what you experience here. So I wish that everybody who is watching this or everyone who's going to watch this, consider this fact that if you want to hope, you want to know. I'll give you an example. My son-in-law's father died this week in a terrible bus crash going to Mexico. Him and his wife were thrown out of the bus. His wife remembers his wife lost a leg. She looked over to her husband, called his name, and asked him if he was all right. He smiled at her, and he said, yes, I'm all right. He closed his eyes, and he died right then and there. As heartbreaking as that is, we should all recognize the hope that was there. He was a believer. He is all right. He's not in that body anymore. He's not going through what he's suffering. He is in heaven with Jesus Christ. His wife found out later that he died during that time. But we've also been seeing miraculous things happen. God shows up even in times of trouble. They've been, he's been doing a work with the medical staff. They just happened to have a surgeon in the area who was on vacation, shows up at the hospital so he can operate on, on my son-in-law's mother's leg. I mean, and put people in their path that they can get help for her and care for her. And there was a lot of bad things that happened too. But God shows up. We have this hope that absent of this body, we are present with the Lord. When we hear that trumpet call, if we're still here, we're going to be face to face in Jesus Christ in no time. The trumpet will, the, you'll hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And bam, you're in the presence of the Lord. We do not sorrow like everybody else. Yes, we mourn. Yes, we feel bad. Yes, we have to go through the grieving process. But we have hope that if our loved ones know Christ, if we know Christ, they'll see us. If, we, if they know Christ, we will see them again. And that I praise God the Father. Because Jesus gives us eternal life. And no one can take it away from you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your son. Thank you for the death on the cross, Lord. Thank you that he gives us eternal life, Lord. Thank you. I pray that you put in each and every one of our hearts who are listening today that we should be sold out for you, Lord. That we should be Stevens, not worrying about persecution, or not worrying about our own lives, our own, our own problems, but to push on to preach you and preach the gospel to everyone who doesn't know you. I pray this in the matchless and in thanksgiving to your son's name, Jesus Christ.